Brittany, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. We've been trying to do this I know. for a minute. I know. So I'm super excited to, to have you here on the show. We're thrilled to, to talk to you about what you continue to build with Shop Latinx. Um, I want to open up the conversation okay. um, to get folks to kind of understand how you got here, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes those conversations take us to somewhat uncomfortable places. So totally understand if there's things uh, we don't want to get too far into. Uh, but just to give a little context to the conversation. Um, you grew up in the 90s in, in L.A., right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you remember about your, your upbringing? Um, tell me what it would like to be able to spend a day with you as a kid. Oh, my gosh. How old? How old are we? Uh, let's, let's drop me into like, you know, you know 10, 10, 12, 13. 10, 12, 13. I was in middle school. I went to Millican Middle School in the mm. Valley mm. in Sherman Oaks. Yeah. Um, I was really into the performing arts. Oh, really? So I was a like theater, theater kid. Okay. So I was in musical theater. <laughs> um, and my mom and I, we lived in a one bedroom apartment mm. in North Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, she worked. She was an admin assistant okay. at a few jobs. Yep. Um, I believe during this time she was temping and then she worked at an architectural firm as um, a, an admin assistant. Admin yeah. And then um, my grandma, so it was mostly during this time, my grandma and my mom mm -hmm. taking care of me, um, picking me up after school, and wow. which was really interesting. In middle school I had, I had, um, I never really hung out with like other Latinos. It was mostly hmm. uh, black and Jewish and white. Was that just because of what the neighborhood was or? I think, yeah, and also yeah. like the musical theater program. Okay. Um, and what I found really interesting was like this duality between like how I presented myself in middle school and then, you know, my grandma would pick me up mm -hmm. and her Honda Accord with the rosary mm -hmm. and, you know, very traditional, yep. you know, I would, I don't speak Spanish, but I would communicate to her in English. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, Spanish. in Spanish. No, in English, and she would respond in Spanish. Ah, okay. okay. And, um, you know, I'd go home. She'd make me beans and rice. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom would come pick me up, like, around 6. Yeah. Um, I'd watch Oprah every day at 3 p.m. <laughs> in Oprah? middle school. I was really obsessed <laughs> with Oprah. I loved Lisa Ling. Mm -hmm. And during this time, I wanted to be um, an investigative journalist. What inspired that? Was it, like different segments of Oprah or was it like, because there was a time where I felt like in that era, in the 90s, there were a lot of type of shows like like investigative journalism or yeah. talk shows and then some of these other kind of Well, I think during this pieces. time was also like early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, what I really loved was I think their ability to like leverage their empathy. Mm. You know, I, I just loved the way that they would ask questions. Mm. I think I always loved the human connection. That's, that was why I was a, I was a theater kid. Yeah. You know, I was able to embody different personas yeah. and be on the stage. I loved it on stage. And, <laughs> you know, I think being able to talk to people um, is something that I really loved. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom was also like a huge empath. You know, she just has this like magnetic energy about her. Mm. Um, oh my God, I'm gonna like cry over my mom. No, but- no, it's um, okay, it's okay. And I think because of her, you know, like she, you know, she'd work in these corporate offices, but always make friends with the like Latino mm. workers, yep. you know, the janitors. Yep. And my, my grandma was a housekeeper and mm. worked at Kaiser as mm. a cleaning lady um, during the graveyard shift. And even my dad, too, you know, he's uh, Nicaraguense. Both my parents were, um, they met in the same apartment complex mm. in Koreatown off Beverly and Normandy. <laughs> um, they're products, you know, they're products of single mothers that yeah. immigrated from my my mom's mom immigrated from Guatemala, mm. and then my dad's mom came here from Nicaragua. They met in high school. Um, it oh. wasn't like a love story, <laughs> but they they had me, they had so you. it was a love so it was story. A love I am story. love. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, I embody love, yeah. and yeah. Um, so even my dad, you know, he he worked at this photo studio, a, a film studio oh. in Hollywood. Yeah. It was called A&I. Okay. And he was really into photography. He taught himself. And mm. that's where, like, all the agents and, like, celebrities would go get their headshots printed for, like, oh, wow. auditions and all of that. That's so this awesome. was, like, early 2000s, yeah. just Hollywood. And, and your dad's, um, like, there. Yeah. Huh. And, um, you know, he, was, he just worked there. Yeah. And, but I think with him, the way that he, you know, he loved 
being behind the lens, mm. you know, and, and taking photos of me and taking photos of other people. And I think both of my parents um, did have that gift of like the human connection. Yeah. And so going back to like Oprah and Lisa Ling, I'm like, oh, I can make a profession out of this, out of this. you know, and I want to do what they're doing. Huh. Um, and I want to meet people and I want to talk to them. <laughs> oh, and wow. so that was me in middle school. I was very inquisitive. I was also was in a lot of parent-teacher conferences, so I was very hmm. rebel, not, I wouldn't say rebellious, but I wasn't really good in school. Did you, were you bored in school? I was bored. I think I was bored, I was antsy. Um, I just didn't really like the teaching style. Like, I like hmm. to get in the weeds, you know? Like yeah, You wanna learn, you want application. You I want, want application, and that's why I love being a founder. <laughs> it's like, throw me, like, push me off the diving yeah. board so I can swim, yeah. and I feel like, they don't do that in the school system. It's no, just read. it's one pace. It's just right. One pace, you know, and then I don't want to do homework as a kid. <laughs> I want to like cut earthworms into pieces, you know what I yeah, mean? And yeah, like yeah. play with my hands right. or like do shit that I want to do. And I feel like these kids, like they're so deprived because we're here writing in packets and tracing letters and multiplying, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I have a calculator for that, you yeah. know? And I know how to, I can do that. I can do right that, now. you know? Yeah. Like, and, so that was me as a kid. Yeah. Um, so you. So this is happening. You. You got your kind of your, your world going on. You're, is somewhat engaged in school, but you know, kind of getting into some things there. Yeah. Um, what was life like at home? What was life like with your your parents? Oof. Hit a nerve. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's okay. Life with my parents in middle school. Oof. Bima. Bima. It's okay. Um, Challenge. Well, thankfully. Yeah. Before I answer that question, I'm, I'm so grateful to have um, gone through healing my maternal wound. Um, and I'm currently working through that yeah. abandonment yeah. wound with my father. Okay. Um, can we get a Oh nap? my gosh, can, can we? Can we have DJ grab some clean Oh my God, a nervous struck. Um, but um, I'm sorry. You're okay. Oh no, God. you don't Do people cry? We've had some crying. <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> I'm the first. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. You're not. You're fine. I promise. Okay. <laughs> Do I wait? No, we, we're good. We're good. It'll come. We'll get it. We'll get it taken care of. I promise. Okay. So do I answer the question? Yeah. Because I can yeah. answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're okay. This is your time, by the way. This is yeah. not, it's not about me. However you want to take this time is yours. Yeah. So my relationship with my parents in middle school, it was really hard. I felt very lonely and isolated. I felt... What was the, what was the driver of that isolation? Did you feel like they just didn't understand you? Were you only child? Uh, yes, I was the only, only child, child, so that's one thing. I felt like I was as well. <laughs> Hard. <It's a> lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's I think a also lot. too, like, you know, I talked to my mom, and it, what's so crazy is, um, my mom actually remarried, and I have two little brothers. I'm 31, and my brothers are 11 and seven. Okay. And they will never experience the, mm. the Bonnie that I experienced. Yeah. Different person. Totally different person. Yeah. And so I grew up with her. You know, like I watched her develop into a woman. Mm. You know what I mean? And I saw her relationship with my father and how tumultuous that was and how much it affected her. You know what I mean? And I also come from a family that has experienced a lot of generational trauma, especially mm. on the maternal side. Mm. You know, like it didn't just start with my mom it and, you know. Layers. It's It was a learned behavior that traces back to my great-great-grandmother. Wow. You know what I mean? Of um, just a, a abuse towards the daughters. Mm. Um, and so my grandmother, who also raised me, you know, graded this is my mom's story to tell, but what I know is that like, and what I've experienced and what I've seen is, you know, she wasn't super nice. And that's yeah. something that my mom and I, even post my grandmother's death, 
are still yeah, processing address. together, yeah. you know? And so with my mom, granted she was young, but she didn't know what she didn't know. You know yeah, what I mean? She only she knew had, what she observed. She got pregnant at 17, mm -hmm. had me, you know what I mean? Was, was abused by my father mm -hmm. and her mom. Wow. And so, and I was born into that. So like yeah. even too, like experiencing anxiety in the womb, you know, heartache anger, sadness. Yeah. And then I come out and I'm a little curly headed ball of anxiety mm. too, you yeah. know? Yeah. And my dad, um, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> oh my and God. let me know if we need to, it's okay. If we need to take a break, yeah. we can, we can okay. do that. We I mean, can, whatever, whatever you think, let me, check, I whatever. think, uh, <laughs> I think I'm better. I think I'm better. Okay. And I also don't want you to be like, well, your makeup and you be like, why are you oh tell me? But tell me, like, BJ, tell me. It's not that bad. I'm definitely red in the eyes. But I think, I think I'm better now. I okay. think I'm better. Okay. So my dad, my dad was my best friend. Like, mm. like that's who you related to. Like, that, is, like that was me. my role dog. Like, yeah. I love my dad. I still love my dad. Yeah. You know, he's, he's alive. He and I haven't talked in about seven years. Okay. But um, we would do everything together. We had inside jokes. Like he would put me on to new music. Like we were just wow. so silly together. Like yeah. with him, I felt like like so. that you're my person, yeah. you know? So many memories in, um, it was around middle school that, I mean, it was always been on, on and off drugs in and out of jail. Mm. And um, when I was a preteen is when he started doing drugs, like hard mm. drugs. And he started and coming you, around did less. Did you know? Like you knew? Could you, as a kid, did you know he was different? In high school. Got it. Yeah, because by that time, those conversations are happening in high school. Probably a little bit in middle school, like hearsay. But in high school, there are more direct conversations about drugs and drinking and partying and stuff like that. You know what? I feel like he he managed to be normal mm -hmm. around me. And then it got to a point where his addiction consumed him. Hmm. And it, I started to see it. Um, and it would be like, you know, so I would spend every other weekend with him and he was just getting skinnier and, you know, mm -hmm. he picked me up from school. He'd be a little erratic. Mm -hmm. He got like, so my dad was on meth mm -hmm. and he got like weirdly into the Bible and like the matrix and like. Donnie Darko and just like some weird hmm. shit. Yeah. And um, <laughs> uh, in high school, I started to like, like he would just t be weird and like talk to me weird or like make me read excerpts of the Bible or like it was just so unlike him, yeah. you know, or like he would be like, oh, I'm going to go move the car. And I'm like, dad, I'm scared. Like he lives off Franklin and Hollywood by the police station. Like it's oh. not a safe area. Yeah. And he wouldn't come back until like the next, the next morning. And then when he came back, he would just like fall asleep on the couch. So I think that like going from having someone on like a pedestal yeah. and then being my best friend, my everything to seeing them Struggle. right in front of me, just like deteriorate. Mm -hmm. um, That's a lot to it see. It was a lot, That's you know? How do you help? Right? Like, and I, I, I blamed myself. Help? Like, I feel like I mm. lost myself for a decade, for a wow. decade, <laughs> trying to understand, like, why? Like, why did my dad leave? And I just, it consumed Ooh. me. It consumed me and it affected everything. Like, how did you, you're a teenager. Yeah, I'm a teenager. <laughs> like, I was Who depressed. did you go to? Like, who, were you able to go to your mom, your grandmother? No. Like, no. It, my grandmother ended up passing. Jeez. Yeah. So high school is really hard for me. Yeah. I'd um, say so. In my senior year, um, I was put into like a 5150. <laughs> Just crazy. <laughs> um, in high school. Yeah. I was really depressed and I didn't have anyone to talk to. Um, what, so what do you do in a 5150? Like, what is. Honestly, it was pretty cool looking yeah. back at it. Um, because I think what all of us, I, I was in a room with so many people from different walks of life. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I was in there with 
a Native American, an Eastern European woman who was mm -hmm. older, you know, a girl who just got out of a relationship with, with her boyfriend and in order for us to eat breakfast, we had to have mandatory group therapy. And I think- Or eat also, breakfast, you had to have yeah. group therapy? <laughs> yeah. Damn, and, I don't even want to talk to people in the morning. I, I would know. Have, yo. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was wild. Like I remember sitting next to this guy who was older, and apparently he did a lot of LSD and it like messed up his brain. So every morning that we would have the group therapy, like it would be his turn. He'd be like, "Yeah, I just got back from Hawaii last night. I had a really good time." Mind you, it's like, bro, you were in the same bunk as me. Yeah, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I think that like that allowed me to see that like, hey, we're all human. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that like going like we're all experiencing things and like we all got here and like we will be OK. Like I made friends during that time with people you never would have known I would make friends with because I just turned 18. So I had hit the I, you know, I hit the threshold. Adult, I was yeah. no I was I couldn't be with kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I was with all the the old heads, yeah. you know, and <laughs> I was the youngest one. And I remember making friends with this guy. His name was Jeff Nail and he was like this older alcoholic in his 40s like redhead mm. scruffy face and like you know he what was cool is that like we ended up adding each other on Facebook mm. and he's like married with kids now you wow. know but I remember meeting him in a place where like we all wanted to die <laughs> you know yeah. and I think that like I actually never told anyone that wow. <laughs> but um wow so, so you, how long did you stay there? For about a week. You were there for about a week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and did things get better? Like, did you start to feel, like, um, at some point, like, did you start to feel better? Or did this kind of start to set your new normal? I, I don't think things, I think this became my new normal. So you were just high functioning with all of this? Yeah, high functioning. Mm-hmm. Wow. For a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I said, it was, you know, I think this time in my life, um, I was going through a lot with my dad. He was just in and out of my life, yeah. very manipulative. You know, like I would end things with him and then he'd come back into my life and mm. I'd get entangled with him again, you know, trying to save him, trying yeah. to, you know, like just wanting what we had when I was a kid, but it would never happen. Yeah. He's totally different. His brain is rewired. Yeah. You know, he has now a few mental things going on and I just wanted him back so bad. And, you know, another revelation that I had was like, I feel like during this time, even I think like Bell Hooks talks about yeah. this, right? Where it's like, until you heal, you will always be looking to fill that void. Yep. Um, and I feel like for years, up until like last month, <laughs> you've been trying. To... I've been trying to fill the void, and it's like down to like the way that someone laughs. I'll mm -hmm. like latch on, or like yeah. you know, toxic behaviors. Yeah. You know, I, I, it just, it's so familiar to me. It's, it feels so normal that you kind of gravitate towards it as kind of messed up as that might sound. It's just what you know. It's like, what I know, you yeah. know, and I think. Even going back to Portland, like it's so quiet that I'm not used to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And just to sit and be normal and have like, you know, want to experience like normal love. <laughs> I don't think I've ever really experienced that. Because there's probably just so much happening. Like I imagine, right? Like that's happening. You're that's senior year high school. This so naturally the next thing is probably like maybe you're going to college. I don't know. Like it's did you... college and then being twenty, living in LA. Yeah, like I don't even. <laughs> Are know. Are you kidding me? Like there's like, so I was much lost. to get caught up in. And I was so <laughs> caught the, up you to know? numb yourself. Like there's so I was, much. I was very caught up. Mm. Um, <laughs> what does caught up mean? You know, I think he was outside. I was outside. Mm -hmm. I was outside five five nights a week. Five nights a week. I was going out all the time, you know. And I also was a bud tender. I was just working random gigs. I also um, internships. I went to Cal Poly Pomona. I got mm -hmm. kicked out for low GPA. What you know, I worked at retail stores. So I tried. There's a part of me that like wanted to get my life together, but there was mm -hmm. a part of me that like also couldn't be alone with myself. You know, mm -hmm. because if I was alone with myself, I'd get 
antsy and I didn't really like who I was and I couldn't really like look in the you mirror face, face myself I yeah. didn't want to face myself what were your what who were you surrounded by during that time right so clearly like there's a part of you that's hustling like you're like I do have to make money I don't have another income so you're doing that but you're also on the flip side like your underworld if you will <laughs> <laughs> you are uh you're out partying so you're not trying to deal with all the things that are happening no so who do you surround yourself with I don't even remember. I feel like I, mm. there's a trauma block around. Wow. <laughs> like I think just like promoters, random women that were just as lost as me. You know, like I feel like LA can really suck you in and spit you out. You know, I was also a bud tender mm. all around LA, working like 14 hours a day. For, like, this is like Bud Lights, like Budweiser. No, bud tender, like wheat. Oh, wheat. I was like Come bud on, tender. It's LA. I was like what? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but then it wasn't until like, I was like 23 that I was like, I want to work in music. Huh. So I got like an internship at Vibe yeah. and then I learned about video production and, um, then I got an internship at Interscope and I was wow. in like the urban A&R. Yeah. Um, so I think a little by little, I started you to get my together, together and I just did the most between the ages of 17 to 23, but I, by the time I was like around 24, 25, I started to get washed really early. Mm. <laughs> you, you, were, you know, you were, like I was you're tired. like, yo, this ain't it. And also too, like I was just in this perpetual cycle of like being broke. Like yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to, I need to figure my shit out. When you... Uh, growing up, did you would was, was that always your relationship with money? Was it always like it wasn't there? I've had a terrible relationship with terrible. money. Yeah, yeah. Um, so twenty four happens, twenty five. You're starting to like want to figure out a, something different. You're very exhausted by the loop. Clearly, yes. <laughs> um, what was what was a pivotal change? Was there a trip? Was there a conversation? What was like that catalyst that really ignited? a different behavior? Ooh, my brothers. Hmm. So, um, my mom, as I said, she got married. So oh. I grew up an only child for 20 years. And um, she told me that she was pregnant with her first son, my brother Noah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was like around when he was three. I think I had like overdosed maybe wow <laughs> oh, shit. so yeah I, I did like dabble in drugs yeah. and um i think i had this like revelation that like i'll be damned mm -hmm. if something were to happen to me or i turn into some sort of like degenerate and my brother would is ashamed of me or like i'm like the older sister who that's a loser that could never get her life together wow and I think that was the biggest epiphany for me. It's like I don't want them to, to see. I don't. Me like I can't. This. My my parents have seen it. I can't let the, this kid see it. Wow. And that was the biggest thing for me. Was like, I need to get my shit together because mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a little brother that's gonna grow up, and mm -hmm. I just don't want him to see that. That is the biggest. Like I would be a, a, so ashamed of myself. Yeah. And what if something happened to me? Yeah. You know. Wow, I mean that is a that's a that's a yeah. that's enough to make you want to like change things. Yeah. Right. Tell me about a part of also um, you were mentioning earlier about um, being able to go see where your family's mm -hmm. from and where your grandmother's from, mm -hmm. and you got a different appreciation for the people that they are. And that you are. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that trip. Like, what, what, what did you go for in the first place? And then what did you discover? Yeah. So um, this was. So I went around the time that I I had quit Interscope. Okay. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but mm -hmm. I knew that I wasn't going to figure it out in the confines of <laughs> a corporation no. with some ugly fluorescent lighting. <laughs> I wasn't going to, you know, packing FedEx boxes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember that's when Uber first came to Los Angeles. Yeah. 
and they were giving out incentives. And I had a Prius during this time. Oh, you had and, good gas mileage. Yeah, I had good gas mileage. <laughs> and I saw Uber was in town, and um, they were, you know, a driver. They were saying a driver can make upwards of, of thirty dollars an hour, and we'll give you a thousand dollar bonus if you sign up and do your first fifty rides. So I'm like, Interscope, I'm fucking out. I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go get paid. I'm about to do this Uber. You know what I mean? Work yeah. on my schedule. Right, like right. I could have like put me on a billboard because like I was the <laughs> you Uber was out master. There. I would put my friends on to Uber. Oh, so you had the referrals. I had I was I was getting the referrals. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so then I told you when I met my Thea in on Facebook yes. Messenger, um, she and I hit it off and I was like, Well, I have this Uber money and like I'm gonna go out there. Oh, wow. And I went and it was such a life changing trip. Mm -hmm. Um I actually went to both Guatemala and Nicaragua separate times. Okay. Um and both just gave me this this newfound appreciation and love for my culture mm. that I've never experienced. You know, in, in elementary school and middle school, I was I was really embarrassed because um, all the all the rich white kids, you know, had housekeepers that looked mm. like my grandma. You know what I mean? Oh, and I wow. think there was like this sense of shame that like yeah. I wouldn't really talk about my heritage or my mm -hmm. culture like you know when my grandma would pick me up i'd be so embarrassed and like so run into the car because yeah. i didn't want anyone to know what were they getting picked up in <sighs> BMW, mercedes bmws mm -hmm. acura suvs i'd go to their house it's like freaking huge in encino in the hills you know and i didn't have that you mm -hmm. know we lived in a very modest home home that my mom worked really hard to pay for and right. provide me nice things but i always felt like really ashamed yeah so to freely be able to explore where my family had come from especially knowing that like my grandma came from this little mountain and made it to los angeles so i can live this dream and be here mm. You know, and I had a million dollars in my bank account a year and a half ago, and I'm about to get more in. That's crazy. Like, That's I love insane. it. I love being Guatemalan. I yeah. love being Nicaraguan. You know, yeah. I love being Central American. Wow. And I love the fact that, like, I'm a Central American founder, and I have a different viewpoint than a lot of these, than a lot of um, other founders yeah. that don't come from the same background that I do. You know, and I love the fact that like my background allows me to make hmm. other Central Americans feel seen too. Yeah. And so going back to my experience in Guatemala, just like the richness of the culture, mm -hmm. the food, <laughs> the coffee, my cousins, you know what I mean? <laughs> like they can freely get fireworks and just pop, you know, like this, <laughs> it's just like, it's just so, you know, and then it also too, like family, community, being in the back of the pickup truck, like this, you yeah. know, we all go to a river. Like I've never experienced that. And when I came back to LA, I wanted to take that with, I wanted to bring that mm, with bring me. Bring that, yeah. And when I did. You never experienced something you know, like that. I, I don't want to leave this. Yeah, one, one million percent. Mm. And I wanted, I'm like, how can I, bring what I feel back and get and, and, and create a community out here. Because yeah. I never really felt, like I said, I, I never really had Latino friends growing up, you know? And um, this is also the time of, you know, this is 2016 now and it's Trump, yep. it's anti-Mexican, yep. you know, or anti-Latino yep. um, immigration policy, oh, yeah. the wall, yep. you know? And so, my experiences in Latin America combined with mm. what's happening now in the TV screen and what I'm listening to every day, it was a mix of like pride and anger mm. that really fueled this next chapter of my life. So if, if you're feeling that, is your feeling that you want to do something about it? Yeah. Or, okay. So what did you decide to do about it? So during this time, I was like attending a lot of protests. Mm -hmm. I was in like Facebook groups for women of color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a lot of anger. I think like most of us do, right? Where it's yeah, like, it's okay to say taught, that. Yeah. <laughs> you're taught Thanksgiving was off. about, you know, you're making turkeys in elementary school with your hands and mm -hmm. painting it, only to then 
pay $10,000 to attend a, a class in college and they tell you the real history of right. Thanksgiving. Like whole different history. You know what I mean? And then and then you go out into the real world and then you learn the re like it's even more layered. Yep. You know, and so I we were, I was angry, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was yeah. angry and I was upset mm -hmm. and I feel like I wasted so many years like of being sh ashamed of myself and my culture yeah. that like when I came back I was like it's on you're in overdrive <laughs> you know what I mean? you were in overdrive I was in over <laughs> over overing like setting my little thing like like you know trying to catch cop uber rides to the protest yeah. you know what I mean yeah, yeah. and like catch them back and then <laughs> that was kind of me like I didn't have a career during this time I was just uber driving and just yeah. trying to figure my life out and I was renting a, a room in a house in Burbank California and I was still a hot mess but I think that I was becoming a little bit more grounded. Mm -hmm. I was figuring it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I surrounded myself with a lot of like-minded like black and brown women. Mm -hmm. And then one time <laughs> I came back from an Uber shift and it was like super late. Like I think like Uber had it, like logged me out cause I was driving like you were 13 just driving, hours. Yeah, you were on. I was driving like 13 hours. They had to log on. you out. Yeah, they had to log <laughs> me out. And um, I go back home, I open my laptop, and I randomly start Googling like Latino businesses to support. Mm. A, a list of Latino owned brands. Because like to go shop with or to donate to or to go shop with. To shop with, okay. You know, like I wanted to support like I everything I did during this time, like I was supporting small businesses. I was you know, I was going to the local coffee shops. Like yeah. I was becoming very intentional oh, yeah. with where I put my money, mm -hmm. you know. I need to wipe my nose. You're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I came home and I uh, opened up my laptop and yeah, I was doing some research and then I came across this article written by some white fool talking about how Latinos have, um, I think during this time, $1.7 trillion in annual spending power. Um, and this is how you can target them. And it was very really? like, yeah, it was like one of those, oh, like nice. Nielsen, I don't know what, maybe it was Forbes, I don't know. Yeah. And I think that's where I had my huge epiphany. Mm -hmm. And that night is when I made the Shop Latinx Instagram account. And I remember going back into the Facebook group of women of color, for women of color, and I said, like, I have this idea. I want to create this account during this time. Mm -hmm. It was like called Shop Latinx Biz. And I if you have a brand or a small business, like I want to promote it. Wow. And then that's kind of how it kicked off. Wow. So did you know what you were doing as far as like the marketing and promotion side using Instagram? Like obviously you wanted to help, but was it anything further than like, I'm just going to post it on here? Were you like linking out to anything or anything like that? Hell no, it was just an Instagram <laughs> account, you yeah. know? like. I feel like even then, up until now, like I was just the vessel. Like you know, and like you feel you're like you're the, steering you're the, the passionate. ship. Yeah, you're very. And you passionate don't know about it. where it's going, but yep. you have full faith that mm -hmm. you know it's going somewhere. You're get there. And so people will tell you like, why don't you get a real job? And you're like, I, I'm holding. I'm my this hands are I'm glued doing. to the ship. Yeah. I, I can't <laughs> this go. This is the anymore. ride I'm on. This is what I'm on. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and I remember during this time, you know, my mom was getting worried. Like, why don't you get a job? Mm. You know, she'd have to cover rent sometimes. You know, sold her cell phone plan, give me money for food. Yeah. And and I was just like, I... I something about this. There's something about this that's really special, Mom. And mm. we have the one point, like the 1.7 and the fact that like one third of us is going to be Latinx in the U.S. by 2030. You know what I mean? And I created something that this community what had been looking for, but no one created. And the yeah. fact that like I made this Instagram account and within weeks I was getting thousands of followers Jeez. and people were saying like, thank you so much for what you're doing. And wow. I really used the first two years to relationship build. That's all I had. I you're had no money, community. you know, but like I would see someone, mm -hmm. you know, performing, doing a poetry night and I'd go out there and I'd meet as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time where I was really surrounded by other incredible brown women, mm -hmm. you know, that were doing stuff for their communities. Right. And I was just like on a high, like, <laughs> you know, and, and Shop Latinx became the bridge for me to, for me to meet to other meet people, people right? you know, so and I a think- a way for you to self, easily engage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Selfishly, like I, <laughs> I used it to make friends, you know, and actually some of my best friends I met through this founder journey of building Shop Latinx. 
And um, so, yeah, that was that was kind of the story of how it started. How did how was your anxiety and your depression as you were in that place? Did you find that you had less experiences with that and that you were feeling better? No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I think that I knew I, I, I found my passion. That yeah. was great. Okay. However, I was still broke. And I was also, again, going back to my father wound, right? And my abandonment wound. I was trying to find love in all the wrong places, you know? And I was in this really toxic relationship with this guy who cheated on me and Mm. kicked me out and threw all my stuff out of our apartment. And, you know, all of this was happening while I was running the account. I had to pick up, you know, Uber wasn't enough. You yeah. know, now ev- now it was like, now everyone's doing Uber and that's yeah. what they're like, gotcha, and they yeah. got you stuck. Now, like, the money's getting Yeah, now the money, and- now I go from $30 an hour to, like, $9, $12 an hour, you know, waiting on rides. Yeah. You know, the bonuses go from 500 to now 45 and I have bills to pay, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I took up nanny jobs. Wow. And... I think there was a point where I almost resented Shop Latinx and what I had created because mm-hmm. I'm here, you know, k- on my mom's couch yep. helping people, and I see all these connections and friendships that are being made. Are I see these like mercados that are now popping up, and I see that like, you know, Shop Latinx is now my our work is now being referenced in like a BuzzFeed article, and all these brands are getting the recognition, wow. which is amazing. But I, Brittany Chavez, am still broke. Yeah, I don't know what to do. And what I've realized in this life is that, like, no one's going to do it for you. Hmm. If you really want it, you have to figure it out. Yeah. And so that's what So what did what you I do did. to figure it out? What did, so you, for all two years, right, you're community building, not making money. No. You got to figure it out. Mm-hmm. How do you flip that switch? I'm trying to think. So... Two years later, now we're going into 2018, 2019. Okay. 2018. And I had learned about venture capital. How'd you learn about that? Through Twitter. Okay. Okay. Through Twitter, I had learned about this woman. Her name's Arlen Hamilton. She Mm. is the founder of Backstage Capital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her story was so incredible. She went from being homeless to then being the general partner of her own fund. (laughs) investing in underrepresented founders. Right. So I learned about her story and um, I learned about what venture capital was. Mm-hmm. And on Eventbrite, there were all these like tech events for Silicon Valley. And I was just on the internet. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm an <laughs> internet kid, you know, I'm always researching. And yeah. it's like, if I don't have the money, then I got to research, you know? Yeah, and, I mean. Right? Like, you got to figure it out. Like, I got to figure it out because no one's going to do it for me. Yeah. Like, I've even down to, like, me taking my driving test. Like, I've always just done it myself. Like, mm-hmm. I always had to figure it out, you mm-hmm. know, or else I would have been stuck. Yeah. And I so, never yeah. wanted to be stuck. I still saw, a, but regardless if I was out in the, like, I always saw potential in myself. Yeah, that's the one thing. And it's, those two things can be happening simultaneously. Those two things. <laughs> I can be a club rat and see potential. Yeah. Those, <laughs> those aren't mutually yeah, exclusive. They're not exclusive, right. You know, and um, so I learned about the world of VC. I, I learned about pitch decks mm. and how to create a pitch deck. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the problem, you have the opportunity. And I always knew what the, what the problem, the problem and the opportunity was. was. It just yeah. needed to be more refined. Yeah. And also, too, with this Instagram account, I saw the types of products that this Mm -hmm. Latina consumer gravitated to. Mm -hmm. Because then I started to hyper-focus on her. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually learn more, and I I get into my first accelerator program. It's called Grid One Tech. like for young founders, entrepreneurs, It's it's for all founders. Yeah, like early stage. Early stage, So. Accelerator uh, accelerators are like an accelerated three to six month course. It's like getting a master's degree, um, but on your business. Okay. You know, so like your business is the case study. Right. So you're identifying like product market fit. What's mm-hmm. the problem? What's the solution? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you're learning all these acronyms. 
you know, like CAC and ATV, LTV, you know what I mean? Like, what is this? You know, e-commerce, PDP, homepage hero, like, you know, and all of it was so new to me, but this was the type of education that I've been craving since mm -hmm. I was a kid, wow. you know? So every day I'd go from also to my Prius, it actually eventually got totaled. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I would backpack from Boyle Heights to downtown I think twice a week. Downtown LA. Downtown LA. How far is that? And maybe like a good four or five miles. Ooh, yeah. Back yeah. and forth. And you're walking. Yeah. And I'm walking mm -hmm. and I'm like walking with my Nike backpack and you know, the same shoes because most of it got thrown out a few yeah. months back. Um, and I was always at the in the front front row. Mm -hmm. Oh like, you know, like I'm like, I have something for Shop Latinx and it's my duty for this to pop off. Yep. You know what I mean? Because I want more friends. Mm -hmm. I want I want to put on these brands. And again, I'm just steering the ship. I don't know. Like, I think I was almost delusional mm -hmm. too. Like, I talk about that with people. I, I, I find that founders to a degree have to be. You have to be to some degree delusional, delusional. in denial, <laughs> um, unable to take advice to a certain degree because you're on this path to try to do something that's theoretically impossible. That's never been done before. Right. And you're, you have to think like, for the most part, you're probably still surrounded by a lot of folks who aren't doing things like that. So you're trying to do something that other people aren't doing, of course, everyone yeah. is going to be like, that is dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've been told that, you know, actually, you know what? I take that back. I've never been told that. Everyone mm. has, everyone that I, I feel like I, I used to pitch Uber driver or Uber passengers. <laughs> I love and this. Tell them to You're follow literally me. in the, in the vehicle pitching. Yeah. I'm in the vehicle. You, like, you can't get over you to jump out my car. Like, <laughs> I need to take you to my desk. So you're going to hear what I'm talking about. Yeah. Follow us. Yeah. I don't care if you're white Asian, like you're going to follow shop .com, like right now, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and I think during that time, I also created a database or a directory of, okay. of businesses. But you know, over time, even in, in these accelerator programs, what I came to realize, like directories are, especially for e-commerce, they're obsolete. I don't go on a directory prior to shopping. No. I leverage the e-commerce marketplace or the platform to be my discovery channel. When you click on the brand section or when I'm looking for products, Yes. you know what I mean? And so being in these, um, accelerator programs. I've been in three. So like, that's the thing I'm just, I, I'm hungry for knowledge. I didn't even know I was capable of that, mm. you know? And I think again, like environment is everything and, yeah. the, and teaching style. And, you know, it's just, I, I love it. I love learning, yeah. <laughs> you know, so much so that like, I, I, I promised myself to chill out for a little bit, just <laughs> live life, just yeah. smell the flowers, hug yeah. a tree, yeah. you know? And, um, so yeah, I, I would listen to podcasts. Yeah. Guy Raz's How I Built This Podcast yeah. was my favorite podcast. And then a year later, I became a fellow and like met Guy Raz. And you met Guy Raz? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was a huge thing for yeah. me. And then I ended up meeting Arlen and now she's one of my investors. She invested in Shop Latinx <laughs> and I, through her, I learned about VC. And there was another one called um, The Pitch. It was produced okay. by Gimlet Media mm -hmm. and a founder, I mean, uh, uh, an investor, his name is Charles Hudson. Mm. He is the GP of Precursor, Precursor Ventures. Precursor Ventures, okay. And um, I would listen to him all the time. And I remember like, I remember one day folding laundry in, in this hot hmm. laundry facility in Boyle Heights with my tank top and my headphones, my cracked iPhone listening hmm. to the pitch. Like, damn, I can't wait till I I, he's going to invest in me one day. He's going to invest in me. Ooh. Mind you, I didn't have a marketplace up yet. Mm -hmm. And um, he just texted me earlier today. He's my investor. Okay. So let's, <laughs> let's, I'm a crazy let's, manifester. I'm a crazy let's, manifester. Let's go back. Yeah. Okay. Because that's, that's crazy. I, I, my life is crazy. Yeah. But it, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about this fundraising stuff. Right? Like we hear about it. But um, it's not as often as you meet people that successfully do it. Mm -hmm. And so you, the way I'm guessing it would be framed is at that stage, you're MVP. You have, yes. a, yeah. you have a minimal viable, viable product. product. Mm -hmm. And you have proof of concept. You got yes. followers, you got engagement, you mm -hmm. got uh, active community. 
and you, see it. you know you can you, you can see it. So yeah. you take this knowledge, you hear these VC, you know, about these VCs, and take me into the first big VC check. Who was it, and how in the world did you get in front of them? It was Charles. It was Charles. How did you get in front of him? Um, so there is a firm called Debut Capital. It's yeah. ran by uh, Pilar and Bobak, and they had been following my journey. They saw that I was in this accelerator program called Tech Stars, and Pilar is an Afro Latina, mm. and she was just like, "This is the first Latinx platform where I really feel seen, and mm. I believe in you as a founder, and we wow. want an angel invest." So wow. they cut me a twenty k check, and they are one of the most hands on investors I've had, mm. and. Um, through them, they introduced me to Charles. <laughs> so I get on a call with Charles mm -hmm. and I was really nervous. And Charles, like when you meet him, he's very like, okay. You know what I mean? He's, he's nicest, nicest guy, nice. but he, he, you can't it's read all in him. his head. Yeah. You know, and this was in late 2020 during the pandemic and mm -hmm. during the holiday. Huh. I'm on EBT. I'm on food stamps. I'm on, you know, I'm on unemployment. Yeah. I have no money in my bank account. I had to sublet my apartment. Mm -hmm. I was staying on a friend's couch <clears throat> in West Covina. And my stomach was in knots during this fundraising process because I yeah. needed this money. Need and it. if I didn't, if I didn't get the money, if it was going to take me a long time, I, did, I would have to get a job. And I only have internships and Uber driver under my belt. Yeah, you don't have work experience. I don't have any work experience. I'm almost 30 years old, zero work experience. Yeah. Am I gonna go be a butt tender again? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so I just remember like, I, I, you know, and what's crazy is, I was able to close a round during this weird time mm -hmm. in America, in the world, within three and a half months. Three and a half months, and what was this round? Like, and the round is a total amount a of million, money you wanted to raise. The million dollar pre seed. You closed a million dollars, never having raised money before, in three months. Mm -hmm. And I met around no more than like 35 investors. But I feel like, again, like when I get feedback, like I, I pride myself on being coachable. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if you give me feedback, I'm gonna take that to heart and so I can do better it. and that's so that I can get what I want. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. obviously I there's a level of discernment that I have to have. Yeah. However, but if you're an investor, you know what I mean? Like I'm gonna listen to you, the investor. Right, because if 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 you're an investor, I should be receiving your feedback. If if, yeah, if, I'm if not your feedback isn't good, you wouldn't be an investor in the first place. Stubborn, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, <laughs> so help me. And so yeah. every with every with every conversation that I had during this period, like I was always iterating, working mm, on my deck, you yep. know, granted looking back, I was a little bit thirsty and it, <laughs> you, you know, mean? like, what do you mean? Just like, I felt like I made them feel like, like, please invest, like, mm. please, like, please, like, even for my demeanor like, no, to like it's, this, like, I'm no, good this, regardless. this is a mutual partnership. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like you're giving me free money. I'm mm. giving you a percentage of my company that's yes. going to be valued at a billion dollars yes. one day. So you should, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> right. You're welcome, yeah. actually. Yeah. And this next round, that's how I'm going to go. Mm. You know, like my my demeanor, I'm more poised. Different. I'm more confident. Yeah. I know I know what I'm talking about before, you know, I was still, I was I my first like time. You. Yeah. How many, so 35, but how many before did you feel like before you got into a rhythm? Um, Maybe about like the 10th, mm -hmm. but also two. After a while, I came to realize that it was mostly the found, or the investors of color hmm. who, and most of my investors, they're all mostly black and Latinx. And that wasn't intentional. But that's but who after, ended up gravitating. I, yeah, at first. But then after a while, it became intentional because those are the ones that understand the power of this Latinx market. Mm. You know what I mean? These are the ones that are impassioned by what I'm building. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that don't have founder bias when they look at me and they, they, they see that I have this it factor and I don't have to show them, you know, I don't have to prove to them. I have them. to prove it to them. You know what I mean? And, and they're betting on me. Hmm. You know, when, when an investor first invests in a, in a company at my stage, they're betting on the founder. Yeah, they're betting on you. You know what I mean? They believe in you. Yeah, and there were a lot of investors that were white that were asking me questions like, I'm damn near giving you, you should be paying me for this call right. because I'm giving you, you don't understand <laughs> 
that your investing thesis, if it doesn't include Latinx, you're doing your it yourself. Your yeah, firm, you're missing out on a your whole market. Your LP is a whole disservice. Mm. You know what I mean by by placing us as secondary. You know what I mean? And that's why all these corporations that try to just do something last minute for Latinx Heritage Month and slap tacos on a t-shirt, you know, they think that's that's doing something for the community or that's making an impact when it's not. It's lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I yeah. think with, with Shop Latinx, you know, I was able to convey that like, hey, we're still early stage, but this is my vision. I want Shop Latinx to be a platform where we amplify and showcase the best products made by emerging Latinx designers. You know what I mean? And these products are one of the kind and like they fit the this this Latinas lifestyle, mm. you know, in the beauty, accessories, home and fashion categories. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, and this is how, you know, and it, here's what I know, here's what I don't know. Yeah. You know, I know that these are the values of this Latina consumer. Yeah. And you can't just earn her trust mm. overnight. It takes time. You know what I mean? And y'all are lucky that I've been putting in relationships and work into these for years. for years because that's all I had. I had no money. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I would show up for people authentically because yeah. that's the type of person that I am. Right. You know, right, like, right. And, and so when even now, like I have, I'm having meetings with investors now and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm target and I want to mm. build a shop Latinx tomorrow. I'm like, good luck. Good because luck. <laughs> this is a human, a human right. company. It's you still can't, relationship based. It's, you can't it's just a human buy to in. human, yeah. you know, good luck trying to cultivate the relationships mm. with these brand owners that I've had. Like genuinely try yeah. it, please. They I need, I need you. a little kick in my yeah. ass. They don't trust them. You know what, what I mean? mean? <laughs> right? Like they, they don't trust them the way that they would no. trust you. And it, it's just and a I'm, different I'm the value. Thing. I'm I'm the value of this. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm the differentiator. Right. And I think over time, I've owned that more. Mm. Did it feel weird before? Did you feel weird about? Did you feel like you were taking the light off of what you wanted to do because you were like, I'm the I'm the person, but in fact, you kind of have to be that person. I still struggle with it. Being in the front of it, like. I don't even know if I'll watch this interview. <laughs> I'm so nervous. Like I, it just, but I, you know, and, but it's not necessarily like, I don't need to be the face of this company. If anything, I, I think that like giving the platform to these up and coming designers, creatives, um, you know, my team, all of that. But like on the back end, like, I want to be doing stuff like this. You know what I mean? Like, it, yes, I take. I, I, I will watch it. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, I want to be talking about, like, I want to be a boss. I want to be yes. a bossy girl. Yes. You know, and I want to. I want to be a representation for women, Central American specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, for my mom. Yeah. My, for my siblings. Um. What was I saying? Yeah, we were we were just talking about being in front of it. Right? Yeah, and, and being um, and being o o okay with it. You know, it is. But I think owning my power is something yes. that I've experienced recently. Mm -hmm. You know, like no one can think how I think. No one can think how you think, and that's what makes us so unique and right. powerful. Right. You know, like no one has the vision that I have for this company, and my vision is so dope, mm -hmm. and I see it like. I see where Shop Latinx is going to be in a few years, and it overwhelms me. Yeah, it feels you can like the most feel it, like like I'm on dr drug, the yeah. best drug, yeah. the best mushroom experience. Yeah. Yeah. When I think about Shop Latinx, I'm so overwhelmed at like how it's going to impact people, how it's going to bring my people together, yep. you know, how it's going to amplify, you know, uh, Latinx founders and commerce and business owners. You know, like it just gives me chills and the fact that like I I've worked so hard to be in this position where like I'm I'm the conductor mm. you know um, it feels really good yeah. you know and it feels good to like wake up and, and get in these stand-up calls with my team and it's all like brown faces <laughs> and they're so impassioned by what we're doing right. and when I have these like one-on-ones with them they're like I just I think you're Exciting. you know like I'm excited I love the mission it's just great. Life is great. Do they ever, I have to imagine a lot of folks um, have come from previous work experiences. Um, and the, the reason I'm curious is because, you know, while you did do internships, you didn't have a lot of experience in environments that they might have been in. 
Do they, does the conversation ever come up about like how different it is working in the environment with you because it is so diverse versus yes, like- Yes, all the time. You know, Cause my work experience, you know, my corporate experience was very much like I was always one of the few. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I think that's been a huge value at like, I feel like that's why when I, every time we put out a JD for a role, we have so many people applying, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not sure what they're saying outside of <laughs> out, out, out there, but yeah. it seems like, you know, when I talk to my team, that's something that they're really grateful for. And I see their tweets and I see them on social saying like, I love my job or like I'm the best boss, you know, and it makes me feel good because yeah. again, I didn't have those types of role models. I you know, from my school teachers to my bosses, mind you, you know, yeah, my bosses at the weed shop don't care about leadership. They mm -hmm. want me to lay um, away a, yeah, an eighth. Right. <laughs> yeah, know? like, it is not. <laughs> so, Luke Skywalker OG, you know, like, <laughs> take that. And, like, so I was never really equipped with the tools, but mm -hmm. again, I think it's, my ability to make people feel seen and yeah. heard and valued or like after a meeting, I'm like, so what are your thoughts? Right. You know, how do you feel? Or I'll, mm. I'll call, you know, something at one of my internships is like they never, you know, it's a bunch of old heads talking, you know, and talking about this consumer and I'm them and I'm sitting there like, hey, hi, but I'm too, <laughs> but you don't cultivate an environment for me to want to raise my hand part and, of it or feel comfortable. Like yeah. And so now it's like, I have a couple of interns and it's like, Ashley, what what do you think about this? Well, I don't know. We'll dive into it a little bit. Like, what yeah. are your thoughts? You know what I mean? And um, it just feels really good. Wow. It feels really good. I love being gassed up, but I also love getting feedback from my team. Like, yeah. what can I do better? It's important because right in your role, you're like, I don't need to hear great news every day. I need to know how we can improve. improve. I need to know what we're missing. I need to know what my blind spots are. Right. Like, right? you know, asking them if I can make any, if Shop Latinx could make any higher right now, what do you think we need? Hmm. You know? And like to hear, I'm like, damn, well, I don't have the money for that, but thanks yeah. for answering. But thanks, thanks, for answering. thanks for playing. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out the plan. <laughs> um, take me back real quick a moment. I, I'm curious about, tell me about Charles, Charles Hudson. Um, and when did he decide to invest and how much did he decide to invest? In Shop Latinx. So in total, he's invested 600000 Oh, my goodness. And so I, I'm just, I can't believe it. You know, yeah. like, or sometimes he'll, like, we talk every other week. Mm. And I met him in person. It's like, ah, like, I just can't <laughs> believe that he's, like, I manifested him into my life. Like, yeah. I remember where I was folding my laundry, listening to him. Mm -hmm. And then I got to be in a meeting face to face with him. And um, it took about like two, two months for him to finally say, I'm in, send over wow. the safe and the wire instructions. And then an additional few weeks for that money to get in my account. And mind you, like I said, you know, I was eating good during the pandemic because I had my little EBT card. Mm -hmm. And then, but to see the business bank account go from like hmm. a few hundred dollars to then all this, now all the safes all are, you know, all this money's coming in and I'm up to a million dollars. I mean, it was, it, it was a huge blessing. Yeah. I think over time, there were a lot of lessons learned from that because, you know, when you get that money, it's not like you're absolved of financial traumas. If anything, mm. it's going to reveal a lot of financial trauma that, you know, was probably in your subconscious it will come to consciousness. Un unpack that a little bit for me, because I, I, I kind of understand what you're saying, but I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on it. Okay. So it's, I it's, it's sort of like you have had a previous experience with money. And just because you got this new money doesn't mean that those behaviors have changed. Exactly. Like, okay. for example... Um, I had like a manic episode the day that we announced the million dollar raise Ooh. because also too, you know, I felt like, oh, this is a huge responsibility mm. and now it's out. Now it's real. Now everyone knows everyone's mm. congratulating me. And I remember I was like in fetal position in my bed sobbing. Like I just wow. want to die. Yeah. It was so weird. Like I, I could never, mm. like, it was just, because I was of the so weight of it. The weight of it, the responsibility, money, you know, money, just money, you know, yeah. like yeah. just, I never had that much, you know, and then even 
I never, you know, there was a thing where like I wouldn't look at the bank account, you know, mm-hmm. like I couldn't come face to face with money. Mm-hmm. You know? Did you feel like while you clearly knew you needed it, did you feel did you have any feelings of like unworthiness towards Yes, it? one million percent. Mm. I didn't feel worthy. Hmm. Like who am I? You know, I'm just it's a girl from the valley. I, I don't I don't know nothing. I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't go to Stanford. Mm. And I have a million fucking dollars. Yeah. Like I wanted it and I worked my ass off to get here. But now you But now it's real. It's real. And now it's in my account. Hmm. And now I, there's all these expectations on me, yeah. which mind you, my investors are amazing. They know this is a long game yeah. and they see the work that I put in, mm-hmm. you know? But it also is like, it's got to be a signal to you too of like, what I'm championing is valuable and it's, now it's got a price associated, associated to it. It has an right? actual valuation yeah. associated, <laughs> associated to the company. Right. You know what I mean? It's my duty to make sure that like shop on X is well funded, yeah. that we reach certain milestones, certain KPIs, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That I, I submit um, investor updates on the regular. Yeah. You know, there's there's so much responsibility now. And I went from, you know, I think it's really hard when you monetize a passion. Yeah. And I don't, that is very tricky. We spoke a little bit about that with um, a, um, an, uh, an, a contemporary artist out of Seattle really? named uh, Christina Martinez. And oh, she, she's amazing. You know, she's amazing. and. She spoke a little bit about how she wished someone would have told her what it would be like to be an artist that also depends on their work as compensation. Mm. She's like, it's just, you have a, she's like, she still enjoys what she does, but it also introduces a different ingredient into the relationship, right? Because it's no longer just for fun. Mm-hmm. Now it's also for fun. And I got to produce, mm-hmm. right? And it adds like, I don't know where your anxiety sits. Mine sits here and it just sits there. <laughs> it sits here <laughs> and it sits on like my heart, like my chest, mm-hmm. you know? And I have trouble breathing. Yeah. And, um, you know, me moving up here from LA a year and a half ago, I think this is the first time in my life where my nervous system has been like regulated. Mm. But yeah, like even from announcing that $1 million raise to where I am now, it took a lot of therapy. Mm. You know, now I'm in bi-weekly therapy. And um, I'm so grateful for the revelations. The shitty easy dude. And I feel like, again, when you're when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a founder, when you're dealing with money, um, especially as a person of color, from you know uh, a hard background, mm-hmm. you know, navigating difficult experiences at an early age, um, it's it can be a really windy road. Yeah. For sure. But I think for me, I would rather stay on this road, hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and see what the finish line looks like and get to that finish line instead of hopping off. And doing anything else. And then wondering, like, what, could what, what if I can't do that? I can't live like that. You I got to experience it myself. And and if I fuck up, fine, I'll eat it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, but at least I experienced it. And, yeah. and now... And, and that is a part, that's what being a sovereign person looks like. And mm. I feel like I'm on that path to be a sovereign human yeah. and make decisions for myself. But before I can really do that, I need to learn how to trust myself. Mm-hmm. You know, and, that, and that's what I'm working on right now. It's just, I want to trust, trust myself that. that I can make good decisions. But even taking that a step back, it's like, you know, therapy and healing isn't just sitting cross-legged yeah <laughs> and or, you know what i mean <laughs> it's doing and, the work and, it's showing up it's having a conversation the work is so it's doing what hard. you don't want to but it is hard um you've inspired a, a question i want to ask <laughs> okay. you um the work is hard you know it's hard you you know as i think back through our conversation yeah you know you you, you have come from a very difficult past yeah. um, and, and you've had these feelings of loneliness and unworthy and and abandoned Meant. And you've s- slowly started to figure out how do you come into your own and something you're still working on. But 
I, I guess my question for you would be is, as you've been able to see where you've been able to get to, just at this point, um, there's got to be other folks going through that. There's got to be other kids going through that. There's younger yous, there's your, your younger siblings. Um, what advice would you give to them as they're trying to come to a place of understanding of who they are on their journey? What advice would I give to kids that kids are- That are coming up, that perhaps want to do something like you, but may have had like a traumatic experience. What advice would you give them as they're trying to find themselves? That's a good question. What advice would I give? Trying to find themselves. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Um. Well, one, before I give them any advice, I'd be like, congratulations <laughs> <laughs> for embarking on this path. Mm. You should be so proud of yourself. Mm. Because it is a step. Huge step. We weren't taught how to do this. Mm -hmm. Some words of advice would just be to, as cliche as it is, it's trust the process. Mm. You know, trust that you are protected and that whatever shit you're sitting in, you'll get out of it. And the outcome is gonna be greater than you could ever imagine. Mm. 